Hi, it's me again, Mark. I'm uh, doing a Lambert scripted. Um, and basically it's on the back of a brilliant article that was posted by um, a guy called Michael Doherty. Um, the material is re really sort of interests me and it, it really breaks down what's going on with the papacy very articulately and succinctly, which was really impressive, I think. And it's, it sort of feeds into a narrative. I mean, as we're moving towards the Synod, you can see the rhetoric is ramping up and um, there's a lot of people are really worried about the Synod. And I've said on Catholic Unscripted numerous occasions that we shouldn't be too worried based on what's happened before. But my own personal concerns lie around the fact that um, the Pope is clearly putting, he's, he's engaging people in the synod process who have got such a strange and wrong-headed idea of what it means to be a Catholic. Now, you might say, you know, how can you say that? Well, you know, like surely they're entitled. How can you say you know more than Cardinal Hollerick about being a Catholic? And it's a reasonable point, but the way that I'm measuring my Catholicism is based on tradition, scripture and the magisterium um, and whether what they're teaching is in line with that. So if we take Cardinal Hollerick, for example, who's the realtor of the of the whole synod process extraordinarily, he came out publicly and said that Catholic teaching was false. You know, he's actually on record saying this. So I don't know how you can expect someone like that to give a a proper explanation of the faith or uh, to have any integrity in a process that's discussing the faith, it already looks like he's got a, an agenda at play. There have been many points during this um, papacy over the last 10 years when, uh, like, you know, I've been absolutely shocked by some scandalous action of Pope Francis. And I thought that his incompetence, if you like, was so overwhelming that some curial official or some group among the bishops or cardinals had to put a stop um, to what was going on. One of the things that have astounded me from the beginning is that, you know, um, as an archbishop or as a cardinal, that you could walk into the Vatican and just assert your will and that that would be accepted. Then, you know, he's coming into Pope Benedict's curia, he's coming into the group of the groups of cardinals and men and bishops that um, that Pope Benedict has put together, and he's coming in with this radical agenda. I remember, really early on, he was when he was engaged with changing the mandatum, and I was at the time explaining away why he was doing. That. I was willing to give him the ground, you know, sort of say, okay, this is a bit unusual, and it causes problems for a lot of our, our local clergy. Um, who are trying to be true to what the gospel and the church has always taught the mandatum is for. Um, but I can see what he's doing, you know, I can see what he's getting at. Um, so, but some of the things that happened were just so incredibly worrying, you know. Um, take, for example, he his appointment of Monsignor Battista Ricca, um, who he, he appointed as his eyes and ears in the Vatican Bank. And this was a man with uh, serious allegations against him that he'd had a, a, a homosexual affair with a captain in the Swiss Guard, um, who he was, was caught in a lift with a rent boy um, and then beaten up in a gay bar. Um, Pope Francis sacked all the members of the Vatican's pro-life academy, discontinued the pro-life pledge, and appointed a new list of members that included anti-life advocates. I mean, this is, you know, this isn't um, speculation. This is things that he's actually done. This is all in the first five years of his papacy as well. Um, and there's loads of other things. There's, a, there's an exhaustive list on the blog, on my blog. If you wanted to check it out, I'll try and put a link um, in the show notes so that you can look that up if you want to. But, I mean, it doesn't, it's not... Um, it's not good for your soul, really, to go through these things. I suppose one of the most worrying things was um, his praise of the Italian politico Emma Bonino, who he called a forgotten great. And um, this was to do with her work with refugees. But 
it's in the face of her enormous advocacy for abortion. Between her abortion activism and being an abortionist herself, Benino is directly or indirectly responsible for the deaths of about 6 million Italian babies between today and 1968. Anyway, that was five years ago. Um, he's built up a huge catalogue of errors since then. And this article written by Brendan Michael Doherty, and it's posted at the National Review, but it was so good that I had to post it on the blog. So you can find it on my blog. Uh, the title is The Pope's Reign and Ruin. Um, and I think the way that it's written shows a real understanding of the subject matter, as well as, a, you know, is is very articulate. It's a flair for communication. There was only one little point, and I think it's like an interesting point, um, because it's about, we're st all of a sudden it started to come up about um, the personality cult, like, um, the, you know, what we call ultramonetism, which is this sort of uh, focus on the Pope, um, which was Vatican I, a trait of Vatican I. You can find it in the documents of Vatican I. Um, but it didn't begin at Vatican I. Um, it, it was earlier than that, when uh, Napoleon abducted Pius VII, um, the then Cardinal Secretary of State was Ercol Consalvi, who was a deacon. He was never a priest or a bishop, uh, despite the fact that he liked to dress as a cardinal. <laughs> um, and he had little cards with the Pope's picture on it made up and distributed across Europe. And that sort of started a tradition. Um, this accelerated after Garibaldi's attack on the Papal States, as things tend to accelerate towards their end, and um, this is how we see the, the, the ideas develop. And really all that came out of the Great Western Schism when you had a number of people claiming to be Pope after the Avignon captivity of the papacy. So there's a long history to this. And you saw that conciliarism was the remedy to that lots of people claiming to be Pope. Um, who does the church claim to be Pope? Uh, and, but from that point on, it went into a more that the Pope had all the power, um, which was affirmed at Vatican I. And I wonder, it's just pure speculation, um, in Cardinal Schneider's recent affirmation of Bishop Strickland, he kind of says that conciliarism isn't um, a good thing in the church. Uh, certainly, I think we were worried when Pope Francis came in, he was very much talking about giving more power to the bishops. And that's ironic, given the fact that he's now moved in a completely authoritarian direction where he's actually dictating to individual parishes what they can print in their newsletters. I'm not joking, that's actually part of Traditionis Custodes and the teaching that's come out after that to ban the Latin Mass. So anyway, this article and the article, basically the subtitle was the papal cult that continued to grow from the First Vatican Council and reached its zenith under John Paul II has come crashing down under Francis. This is it. Pope Francis closed out his summer by praising the Mongolian and Russian empires for their tolerance and humility before criticising American Catholics for their backwardness and narrowness. No, you read that right the first time. He praised the horde of Genghis Khan and the imperialism of the Russian Tsars for their tolerance and then went on to criticise American Catholics for a sin he made up called indietrismo, which means backward looking. This from a man occupying an office whose occupants used to vow to shed blood if that's what it meant to keep inviolate the discipline and ritual of the church, just as I found and received it handed down from my professors. I think that's a brilliant quote to put in there, you know, um, that the whole idea of the papacy, the whole idea of the Pope is to hold in perpetuity the deposit of faith, the apostolic faith given to us and complete at the death of the last apostle until the parousia, until Jesus comes again. And that's what makes the Pope a centre point of unity. And that's why we're seeing so much friction. So Doherty continues, now back in Rome, the Pope is getting back to one of his favourite pastimes, rehabilitating a well-documented sex pest because he has the right progressive friends in the Curia. This time it's Father Rupnik, a Jesuit and plainly terrible artist. Rupnik seriously abu serially abused a group of nuns. 
the Vatican in investigation into Rupnik and his religious center finished with a report, I kid you not, praising his confreres because despite a media uproar, they chose to maintain silence and to guard their hearts and not claim any irreproachability with which to stand as judges of others. That's in speech, that's in quotation marks. In other words, good job keeping the amerta and not being so judgmental about the sexual criminal in your midst. All this is preparation for the Ballyhooed Synod on Synodality, which is literally a conference of bishops dilating on the authority of conferences of bishops. The aim of the Synod, rather plainly, is for a large group of bishops to debate each other about survey material they guided some small number of lay Catholics through in their home diocese, and whether this pile of papers gives sufficient cover for the Pope to begin chucking certain moral and dogmatic teachings of the church overboard in favour of newer understandings. It's a truly strange exercise meant to obscure the Pope's, Pope's role in changing the faith. Basically, he's going to ask a bunch of bishops to write up a document showing how, that the church in general has come to a new understanding of itself. It's hard to unpack how much of a failure this already is. The very idea of a synod on synodality it's like having a meeting about meetings. That uncomfortable, guttural sound and hissing you are hearing from Rome is the ecclesial snake choking on its own tail. The Pope's constant comments on backwardness and condemnations of ideology are his attempt to get past the idea that the Catholic faith has real intellectual substance that has been defined, clarified and distilled through the ages. This process, whereby early scriptural and liturgical statements about the divinity of Jesus Christ, the nature of the Holy Spirit and God the Father are, over the centuries, expressed in new terms such as the Holy Trinity, is what St John Henry Newman called the development of doctrine. Newman had rules for distinguishing between true and false development, tracing all the way back to St Vincent of Lorenz. A true development is that which is conservative of its original, Newman wrote and a corruption is that which tends to its destruction. The law of non-contradiction applies. But Pope Francis does not operate like this. He has already claimed to develop doctrine to make the idea of the death penalty formally recognised as a morally permissible in the church into a sin. He did this by asserting that some new understanding of human dignity had come about in history. And this new understanding, combined with a series of ill-defined social observations and opinions that prisons were now sufficient to protect the public from criminals, made the death penalty morally impermissible. There are several stunning things to notice in this. First, the assertions did not interact with or even pretend to engage the vast body of moral and theological reflection on this topic in the church history. Secondly, these social assertions were themselves open to serious challenge. Had prisons really improved that much worldwide in just a few decades? Weren't some criminals like El Chapo, for example, obviously able to command murderous criminal enterprises even while they were imprisoned? But most stunning of all was that the new teaching had no religious warrant whatsoever in sacred scripture, ecumenical councils, doctors of the church, the Christian faithful or the magisterium. Throughout history, the, church self, the church's self-understanding was the guardian and interpreter of divine revelation, those mysteries that God disclosed by special action in history. But in this revision of its moral doctrine, the church was asserting and hoping to demonstrate its competence to draw radical and moral conclusions directly from its own reading of the present social conditions of humanity, apart from revelation. In the 19th century, when the Catholic Church was responding to the age of revolutions by asserting the infallibility of its teaching authority and the Pope's peculiar charism of infallibility, some critics worried that the papal authority would begin to appear like a special bauble that occupants of the office could use to innovate. Newman was emphatic that papal infallibility was tied up intimately with the infallibility of the Church as a whole and that the power was largely a negative one built for the purpose of condemning error, certainly not for pioneering new truths. But it's quite clear these days that Pope Francis' greatest fans want him to use his papal authority to condemn moral, social and liturgical traditionalists, and even to revise or significantly reform 
church teaching on the matters associated with moral and social traditionalists. The church's ban on artificial contraception, its reservation of holy matrimony to men and women, its reservation of holy orders to men. The Pope's current head of, co of the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith, the office formerly used to assist popes in guarding orthodoxy, now boldly talks about the doctrine of the Holy Father as if this personal moral enthusiasms of Pope Francis were binding on all Christians. They even talk sometimes of Christian duty to the present magisterium of the church rather than the perennial one. But I have to warn them that the effort is self-defeating. A church of today that present, pretends to release us from the church of yesterday is a church that confesses its irrelevance. After all, it implies the existence of a church of the future which can and may well be anything. The office of the papacy has, since the time of the apostles, been charged with preservation and conservation, not innovation. That is why its occupants used to take such a blood-chilling oath, promising fidelity to what was handed to them. The attempt to use it for other purposes will only damage the office. In fact, that's precisely all Pope Francis has accomplished. The papal cult that continued to grow from the First Vatican Council and reached its zenith under John Paul II has come crashing down. It has a lot further to fall. I think Doherty, that's the end of uh, Doherty's bit. I think that's outstanding. His erudition really shines through his prose and he clearly and succinctly marks out the key points. To quote the, the historian, the Cambridge historian, Richard Rex, the ideological waves of our time break relentlessly against the rock of Peter and seem to be wearing it down. Faith alone assures us that they cannot prevail, for the signs we see are not good. Schism is already visible in Germany and the United States, and it's close to the surface elsewhere. Some cardinals and bishops talk bl blithely of changing the teaching of the church, and may be so far deluded as to believe that this is part of their job description. The vile doings revealed in the sexual abuse scandals along with the contemptible inadequate handling of such matters by the ecclesial authorities, have compromised the moral authority of the church to run an unprecedented, to an unprecedented extent. In the end, one can do little better than leave the last words to Chesterton. Hope means hoping when things are hopeless, or it is no virtue at all. I think the important point really is that all that Pope Francis is achieving is undermining the authority of the Pope and of the Church. And I wonder if the bishops and the, uh, can see it. Because all you seem to see from the bishops is their continual pushing forward of Pope Francis, of his, of his words, like um, his ecology, his uh, Laudato Si. Um, which, you know, I've said before, I'm not knocking Laudato Si. And I believe, you know, that it was something that was taught by Benedict XVI and something laudable and something that we've got to take responsibility for the environment. But at the same time, this is the wrong telos. It's the wrong idea that um, we can make heaven on earth. You know, that's not the business of the church. Yes, we have to be good guardians, but it seems to be an easy target for the bishops because it's uncontroversial. Ultimately, of course, it just rings of hypocrisy to the young people that I teach and have spoken to uh, because Green, Greenpeace or, you know, loads of other organisations are doing it much better than the Catholic Church. So why is the Catholic, you know, if that's all we've got to say is a poorer version of something another organisation is saying, what, what have we got to bring to the table? I'd argue that we've not got very much at all to bring to the table. I wonder if this Rupnik thing, you know, this, the Rupnik thing's been going on for months and months now. Um, it seems that he was excommunicated once the allegations were proven and then Pope Francis seems to have intervened and cancelled that uh, excommunication and it's rumbled on. He's not really been, can you know, he's not been cancelled. He's still been a public voice uh, and it's now got to the point where it seems like there is a, a, a public effort in Rome to rehabilitate him. That is incredibly myopic from from Rome, you know, to think that people won't see that and won't condemn that. And of course, it's just part of a, a, a number of um, similar incidents that Pope Francis has been involved with. Uh, you could mention Fernandez, you know, that, that's just been 
as Cardinal Ladario has stepped down, retired from um, his job at the uh, Dicastery for the Doctrine of the Faith, we have seen that um, this new guy has been put in place, who's a, another friend of Pope Francis, Archbishop Fernandez. Um, and this guy is someone who was caught covering, covering up sex abuse in his own diocese of La Plata. Um, and he's also authored a book of erotic poetry directed at teenagers. I mean, the guy is obviously a problem. But I think, as I've said on numerous uh, Catholic unscripted, I, I think the worst one is the sex abuser, the serial sex abuser, uh, Bishop Gustavo Zanchetta, who was sentenced to four and a half years in prison in 2022 for sexually assaulting two former seminarians. And um, the pillar noted at, that this was despite mounting complaints from local priests about Zanchetta's disturbing contact, conduct towards seminarians. Francis sided with Zanchetta. According to the former vicar general of the diocese, even after the obscene, there were obscene photographs of the bishops, of the bishop and of young men were discovered on his phone, um, the Pope accepted Zanchetta's explanation that he'd been hacked by conservatives and anti-Francis forces in the diocese. Even after accepting Zanchetta's res resignation because of the complaints that were against him, Francis actually created a sinecure position for him in the Curia and gave him a home in the Vatican Hotel where the Pope himself lives. I don't know how many of these things we have to stack up before we see just from that, just from the fact that the Pope hangs out with these people, that there's a problem and that he's stacking the church. So what do you think of that? Leave a comment, subscribe, share the video and pray for the Synod on Synodality.